Hey, thanks for joining us at Eden Worship Center for our online service. Here's what I want to ask you to do. Let's treat this time that we're about to spend together as sacred and set apart to the Lord. So right now, put away all the other distractions that are around you and begin to press into God. Sing like you're in the room and pray like you're in the room and dive into God's word like you're in the room. So right now, go and grab your Bible. We believe it's the word of God that does the work of God in the people of God. So have it in your hand. If you're from another congregation of believers, we're glad you're joining us. We hope you're blessed by this time we're about to spend together gathered around God's word. But we hope that that's just supplemental to what you're getting in that local church. You need to be investing your time and talent and treasure there. Right now, together, let's ask that God would open our eyes to see Jesus clearly that we would see ourselves, our sin clearly, that the gospel might look beautiful, that God would be glorified and our hearts and lives would be changed. Jesus, you heard our cry. All right, good morning, church. Good morning, come on in. Hey, if you're out in the hallway, let's make your way inside, find your spot. We're glad you're here to worship with us. Let's stand together. And again, I think this week we have a uh, video for our call to worship. It is awesome to be able to see some of our college kids who are not with us, but with us, uh, giving the call to worship. So let's go ahead and uh, play that video. Good morning, Eden Worship Center. I'm Genesis Reed at Huntington University. Please stand with me for the call to worship. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What a hope that we have anchored in Christ. Not necessarily in this world around us or what your week just looked like or what it will look like, but that our hope is in the power of our God to save and the power of our God to keep. So let's just sing this song together in Christ alone.
bursting forth. hope for your people is who you are. Thank you, Lord, that you are unchanging yesterday, today, and forever. Thank you, God, that in our darkest, most shaken moments, you are the king sovereign upon the throne. Oh, we pray, help us trust you. Help us see you more. Open our eyes as your people gather together to worship this morning. Let our eyes and our hearts and our minds be open to see Jesus in all of his glory, to see him as radiant, sovereign, ruling over all things. In this time, as we sing, as we study your word, let your name be exalted, we pray. And all the church said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning. We are glad you are here to worship with us. Uh, We have a lot that we're going to be going through today, so I want to just hit some of these announcements super quick for you. Uh, We've got a couple uh, special things that are coming, uh, one of which that is not in your bulletin community groups. We had uh, the community group kickoff last week. Uh, In the coming week, we're going to be meeting. Community groups meet on the second and fourth Sundays of the month. Uh, the book order that we had in was supposed to be here by this past Friday, and uh, thanks to 2020, uh, everything is a little bit messed up with deliveries and things like that, and they told us it's not going to be here Friday, it's going to be here tomorrow on Monday. Uh, so if you want to stop by and pick up one of those books, uh, you can do that. It, group leaders, if you want to just communicate with your people on that Uh, But we're going to be studying together the treasure principle. Uh, Hopefully it will be really encouraging to you as individuals and families as well. Uh, So we're excited to have Dave and Wilma Yoder here with us this morning. Uh, We're going to be later on taking up a special offering for them just to bless them, to encourage them. Uh, which I believe is on this side over here. Uh, You'll see we have the offering boxes a little bit different. So all the way on the black tables are the offering boxes at the end of the service. We'll take up the offering. Uh, But then inside of those, one is a blessing box for Dave and Wilma. If you just want to bless them, encourage them. Uh, This is probably their last Sunday with us. This go-around, they're going to be heading 
back south. And so if you want to just bless them as we send them off, I think that would be wonderful. We're going to get to hear from them in just a little bit. Uh, over on this side, we have a blessing box for, uh, it's weird because it says log splitter on there. Uh, we, I don't think we've ever had a log splitter blessing box before uh, on a Sunday morning. But uh, one of the awesome things that has happened at EWC is we talk all the time about God joining us as family one with another, that, that he unites us. Uh, we've had a family from the church who uses wood heat to heat their house, and uh, Roger Kaufman had a lot of health issues uh, starting here a couple years ago, and several of the guys from the church for the last couple years have gotten together and cut the wood for Roger and Janet uh, just to bless their family. And we got talking, you know what, this blessing could be easier and more manageable uh, if we just bought a log splitter to make that happen. And we had a whole bunch of, by the way, this wasn't my idea. I love when these sort of family ideas don't come from me. Uh, In fact, Josh Downey was a big driving force behind this. Uh, And this week, uh, Britt Heiser went out and actually bought the log splitter. Uh, And if you want to, as part of the family, maybe you're like, I can't be there to help cut that wood, but I would like to be part of that blessing, uh, give towards that. Uh, You can just Put it up there. Now, let me just make a little bit of a side note here, because this is generally what happens on mornings like this. Uh, We sort of have uh, our tithes, our offerings that we're going to give to the Lord, and then we're like, oh, there's other things, and then we start splitting the menu up. Uh, And I would would encourage you, biblically, when we think about these uh, giving offering things, uh, the Bible's pretty clear that these are additional free will offerings, right? So you know us, we're not constantly pushing for more money and more money. But we're going to be studying the treasure principle, and I'd kind of like for us to get this right in our heart. That we have have something settled in our heart between us and God that we're going to give of the first fruits uh, of what God has given us. That's sort of that tithe that we give to the Lord, saying, God, you have provided all that we are. And God says, bring that into the storehouse so that uh, there may be food in my house. And then there was these additional things that we find in the scripture, and that's what those are. So I would, I would just challenge you, right? Nobody's going to be following you around, checking your checkbook balance. I would challenge you, give as you have purposed in your heart, joyfully to the Lord, saying, God, you've provided all good things, and then make these gifts in addition to that. God, I'm going to invest. By the way, here's a, a preview of what's coming in this book. I'm going to invest the good things that you've given me in your kingdom and these people who are around me. That rather than just holding on to it, God, here's my, my tithe, and I get to keep the rest that I'm going to be investing the rest of what I have in these other things because there is treasure eternal when we do that. So anyways, just a thought on giving. We don't talk about it much, so if you're visiting with us this morning, you're like, oh, this is one of those churches. Uh, go back and watch the live stream. We, we like never talk about giving, but I, I really think it's important for us to get some of the things right in our own heart. Uh, Just a reminder, we have a pre-K nursery that's going to be available during the sermon this morning. Uh, So normally we we pack all our kids up here and pray for them and send them off. Uh, Because of the whole COVID thing, we're not doing that. We are going to pray for the kids. And then if you have kids who are uh, pre-K and under, uh, just off of the kitchen, just on that end of the hallway, is going to be a nursery available. Uh, I don't know what the sign-up sheet looks like. Uh, But if you haven't signed up to be a part of that, I would encourage you to sign up uh, to help make that ministry happen here at EWC. All right, Dave and Wilma, why don't you come up? I I just asked them earlier in the week if they would take some time and just share a little bit of their heart, a little bit of their lives, what's been going on uh, in the ministry that they're a part of down in Youth with a Mission in Orlando, Florida. So Dave and Wilma, welcome. It's always glad to have you home. So I'm going to begin by saying thank you for your faithfulness in making it possible for us to serve in what God has called us to. It really is. that I, I'm not sure how to express it that you would fully get it. Harold and Janice get it. I know they do, and there's a few others. It just, uh, I want to say thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart. It, it really is. It's a blessing. I want to share a few things of of what has happened and what is happening. Uh, So in our lives personally, 
2020 has been interesting, just like everyone else's. Uh, so the, uh, the projects that I've worked on, uh, an office unit that we just finished just before we left, uh, the God story in that and how that has happened. Someone donated uh, a triple white office unit. And so the logical person was that I would be the guy who would figure out how to make it happen. And it was, it was a really good journey. Uh, to it, it meets a need for us as a community uh, the, for office space. And I want to share a story that, that has come out of the last, it's been about a year and a half now. We had a team that went to, uh, to a Muslim nation and their whole heart in going was they wanted to build a relationship with someone and then share the gospel with them. A little bit of the backstory of the person who had this opportunity came from, from a difficult place uh, in, in the time that she was with us. God really reconciled her life and, and, and put her broken life together. She went, they went on their trip. God brought her together with the young lady. She invested time and relationship with her. And before, they, before their time was up in that, in that location, she shared the gospel. The young lady accepted Christ and desired to be baptized, so there was water close, so they went out. There's literally a picture. I don't have one, but there is a picture of her baptizing this young lady in, in uh, ocean water. So they come out of the water, and, and this, this young lady says, I'm, my family doesn't believe. I'm all by myself. What do I do? Well, there, we have, there's people from our community who are living there, and so they were able to connect, that, connect her with them for someone to disciple her going forward. That's just one of the stories that we get. Uh, probably the biggest stories that I see are the things that happen in the staff people, uh, staff relationships, that God uses, uh, and I'm just going to put in a tag for the Sunday school. Uh, one of the things that came up this morning is God uses relationships in the church to shape us into the image of Christ. I'll just put it that way. And so I see that happening in our larger community because we're all broken people. God brings us together, me included. God has sanded on me probably more this year. I've been more aware of it this year than probably ever. And yet in that process, there's, there's growth that he brings. He forms us into the image of Christ, which is his end goal anyway, that we look like his son. Some of the local ministry that we have, there's, there's a downtown area. There's a, a lake called Lake Eola. If you're familiar with Orlando, uh, there's quite an eclectic group of people that are down there on Friday nights and Saturday nights. And so there's opportunity to minister the gospel to, uh, to people there. Uh, there. Yeah, there's been involved in that. The, the, COVID, the COVID side of things, our school is about half of what it normally is. But praise God, there is school and the... Uh, it's just been interesting. It's been a really interesting year. God has been faithful. He's shown himself faithful again and again in provisions for, for students coming and provisions for, uh, for the community, the larger community. With uh, and Just to share a little bit of who and what we're connected to. So there's, there's like 180 acres. And our base director, his, he has the opportunity, he has the joy and the privilege, and yet it is, it can be difficult, of raising funds, not only for himself and his household, but to develop the base. And so we've just seen, in that, we've seen God's provision in people giving generously uh, and knowing that God was touching their hearts and he was moving in their hearts. Uh, yeah. Well, 
One thing that just came to mind is uh, before my neck started my neck started flaring up and all that. I was going with a group to a nursing home right next mm -hmm. door, and for me, it was really I really liked it. It was interesting, exciting to see what the what the ladies were doing that were there and got to talking with some of them. And uh, one of the ladies, when we went, the girls that I went with, they said, well, Mama, you go, you go back and talk with her. And every time I went back there, she was like, oh, you're, you're the one that was back here. Your name is Wilma, right? I said, yeah. I came back to try to, uh, to so I just wanted to talk to you and just can't think of the name I wanted there, but just to mainly just to talk to her and just minister to her. And that that part was really exciting for me. And of course, me, me stopped doing that. And that was a, in a quarter. Like we were split up with a, like three three months in at the, uh, at YWAM, the the group the oh whatever our years the, are the divided quarter. into quarters so yeah. there's three months yeah. and then our staff as staff people to to help keep us connected with what we're about as a mission mm -hmm. we have different assignments every quarter mm -hmm. yeah. Of, yeah. of areas of ministry that we mm -hmm. get we get placed in mm -hmm. uh, sometimes going to on the Friday night. Uh, sometimes going to there's there's a variety of different ministries mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that that we get plugged into to help help us stay to help us keep our focus on why we're there mm -hmm. and that it's not about just building a place. Yeah. So yeah, I really enjoyed doing that. I was kind of sad when we when the quarter was over and we didn't go there. But they just told us that the quarter is over, so we quit yeah. going. There's been times I wanted to go back, but yeah. it's just not been working out for me, so. Yeah. 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 yeah I've just been, after that, we've just, I've just been sitting around. But yeah. It's been good. Yeah. It's yeah. all going to come to an end. Yeah. I hope not. Yeah. No. Well, hey, just an encouragement. Uh, Wilma had surgery here recently. Uh, continue just praying for God's healing, uh, restoration in her body. Uh, here's something David would not tell you this morning, and that's that their uh, ministry support is on the low end of things. And God has worked, he was telling us some of the stories, uh, just miraculously to provide for them. But it's been really, really, really tight. Uh, so I would just encourage you, not only in giving this morning in blessing them, but maybe there's some people here who would say, man, I can, I can support them for $25 a month or $50 a month and uh, help provide for what God is doing. So would you just join me as we pray for them real quick? God, thank you so much for our brother and sister. God, it is so good to see them home with us. And yet we know that, God, uh, home is not just this community and these houses and these people and this building. God, you have joined us as family. And so, God, that, that fact that we're brothers and sisters is not diminished at all because we live in Indiana and they live in Florida. In fact, it's even greater because they're choosing to live there for the sake of the gospel. And so I, I pray, God for the sake of the gospel, because of the good work that you are doing through them, would you provide? God, for the sake of the gospel, because of the good work that you are doing through them, God, would you strengthen them? Uh, would you bring healing to Wilma's body? God, restoration from what doctors and nurses can't even do. God, thank you for the things that they can do, but we pray go above and beyond what they cannot do. Lord, supernaturally, would you continue to touch her and heal her and God, for the sake of the gospel, because of the good work you're doing in them, I pray the things that you leave, what looks like to us, undone. Mm. Things of healing and budget shortfalls. Mm. 
Lord, in those moments, would you be the lifter of their head? who causes them to look to you, to trust in Christ in a way that the world and even their family around them sees and goes, there is something real in what they have. Mm -hmm. Oh God, would you be not only the provider, would you be the sustainer? Mm -hmm. Lord, would you see them through every moment? We pray a blessing on their, their marriage, on their household. We pray a blessing on their ministry. God, go before them, come behind them. Fill them with your spirit, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Pastor John, come on up. Good morning. You know, uh, one of the most joyous occasions in the church is when God miraculously brings a new life into the church. And that joy is even greater when you know that that new life is one that is going to be raised in a way to honor and glorify the Lord. And recently, a new life was brought into this world for Brett and Nadia and little Jacob. And uh, this morning, we're going to celebrate that through uh, baby dedication. And on that note, I want to say this. Uh, as we're here for a baby dedication this morning, we need to to, to acknowledge that this is not to be equated with Jacob's salvation, that that is something that as he grows, as he learns, as he's spiritually led by Brett and Nadia, God will open his eyes at a later time in life to how wondrous God is and how much he needs that wondrous God. But this morning is about dedicating Jacob to an upbringing that glorifies God. You know, we, we could even call it a parent dedication as it is Brett and Nadia committing to dedicating themselves to the spiritual nurturing of Jacob so that when the time does come, he understands and is ready to follow full-heartedly the amazing God that we serve and that we worship. <coughs> Excuse me. In Deuteronomy 6, I'm going to read a few verses. And as I talk here this morning, of course, I'm uh, talking to Brett and Nadia, but I'm talking to everybody here. There may be some young people as I'm talking about what it means to raise a child in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There may be young people who are like, well, this doesn't apply to me. I don't have kids. Lord willing, maybe one day you will and ask anybody and they will tell you, don't wait until you're a parent to learn to be a parent. Learn what you can before then. For some, maybe your kids are out of the house. And you're like, well, I've been there, done that. I don't need to hear this. Well, the Bible makes it clear that the older are to teach the younger. And who better to teach the younger about parenting than those who have gone through it and actually survived? So uh, this is for everybody here this morning. Uh, but I really want to talk to Brett and Nadia out of Deuteronomy chapter 6, uh, just for a couple minutes. And it says, now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you. This is beginning in verse 1 that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you, and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord your God, Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you, in a land flung with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be in your heart. Then listen closely here. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk along the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. You shall teach this diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. Parenting in a way to glorify God isn't just about bringing your kids to church. It's not just about putting your kids in Sunday school. 
It's not just about sending your kids to youth group. Notice here, God puts it in the light of raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord is about how you live your life. It's not about what you do on Sundays. He says, teach this to your children. To love God with everything you are, teach it to your children when you sit in your house, when you're walking by the way, when, you're, when you lie down, when you rise up. It's about how you live your life before your children. It's about what is the focus of your household. During the week is the focus of your household School, sports, work, and then on Sundays, it's about Jesus. This says that the focus of the house, when you rise up, when you lie down, when you're walking by the way, when you're sitting in your house, it's about Jesus. That is what God calls us to as parents. That is raising your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Not relying on the church on Sunday mornings or Sunday school teachers or youth pastors. They might be useful tools, but it's kind of like taking a vitamin and saying, I don't ever have to eat again because I took a vitamin. Won't end well for you. The church, pastors, Sunday school teachers, youth pastors, they're vitamins. You parents supply the sustenance and the nurturing in the Lord that God is going to use to bring your children to a knowledge of him. It's about a lifestyle. And uh, understanding these things, if I could have Brett and Nadia come up with little Jacob. All right, Brett and Adi, I'm going to ask you a few questions here, uh, questions of commitment. And after each question, if you are willing, by the grace of God, to fulfill that commitment, I want you to respond simply by saying, I will. All right. Brett and Nadia, by the grace of God, will you raise Jacob in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ? I will. By the grace of God, will you help him to know God for himself? through God's word, as you read together and teach him, and from the life you lead, modeling Christ-like character. Amen. Brett and Nadia, by the grace of God, will you walk him as he matures, and when the time is right, lead him to put his trust and hope for salvation in Christ. Amen. And uh, church, you know that, especially if you're parents, it helps to have support. And we are family. And Brett and Nadia need your support. So I'm going to ask you as well to make a commitment. And if you're willing, by the grace of God, to fulfill this commitment, with each question, would you respond, we will. So church, by the grace of God, will you walk with Brett and Nadia as they raise Jacob to fear the Lord? And church... By the grace of God, will you pray for them, encourage them, help them through both praise and correction, and make every effort to see that Jacob comes to know comes to know and love the one true God through faith in Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. The greatest way to grow the church is through generational faithfulness. Through the caring and the raising of children who will then in turn raise their children in the fear of the Lord. Who will then in turn raise their children in the fear of the Lord. What an incredible way to grow the church. And uh, we want to, in light of your commitment, and again we understand that this is by the grace of God. It is a difficult thing sometimes to raise children. And it is always by the grace of God. But his grace is greater than anything. So 
I would love to pray for you guys and for Jacob uh, before uh, you guys return to your seats. Let's pray for these guys. Father, we come before you and thank you so, so much for little Jacob. Father, what a blessing. Lord, you say that children are a heritage from you. The blessed is the man whose quiver is full. The children are a gift from you. And Father, we believe that wholeheartedly. And Father, I pray that you will find us as a church putting that belief into practice as we encourage and demonstrate how much we love our children. Father, I pray for Brett and Nadia as they take on this incredible responsibility with Jacob to raise him in a way that first and foremost glorifies you. Lord, we're not looking for Brett and Nadia to change a heart or to bring a result to pass. But Father, we pray that by your grace, they will parent in a way that glorifies you. And then Lord, we trust the results up to you, up to you, the one who can change a heart, you, the one who can bring them into a relationship with yourself. Father, I pray that you will make Brett and Nadia's joy complete, that as they parent to glorify you, that they will see the salvation of little Jacob. Father, they will see the thing that every Christian parent longs for, to see their child walk with you and glorify you. Father, I pray that as little Jacob grows, that he will have a dynamic, vibrant walk with you. Father, I pray that as Brett and Nadia, by your grace, raise him to be a straight arrow, that you will use him as an instrument of righteousness in this world, that you will aim him at the heart of darkness and he will be an arrow shot true. Father, use Brett and Nadia, use Jacob for the sake of your glory and the sake of your kingdom. And Father, we will give you all the praise and the glory for this. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's stand together and worship. Well, John just ruined parenting with his prayer because that seemed a little lofty. Like any, any other parents ever feel like that? Like, well, I got no shot at that. Uh, I, man, I, I have trouble just living that out for myself, let alone living it out with my kids watching. And I think what a beautiful reminder that our parenting is grace-filled parenting. It, man, we hope you get it right and we hope you get it better but our hope is not in you getting it better. It's in our God. Our, our God who has the power to save your kids just like he has the power to speak into darkness and void and say, let there be light and suns and solar systems come into being. So let's just sing and remind ourselves, who is it that can light the fire of righteousness in our kid's heart? Who is it that can set all of the universe in motion? It is our God.
forgive us when we turned away his love and conquer us with kindness there is only one who is our oh parents for your children
Amen. Lord, through all the universe, may your praise echo. May your name be known, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Kids, if you want to head off to the pre-K class, if you are that age, or parents, if you want to take them there, uh, you can send them off at this time. Other kids, if you want to run to the back and grab one of the uh, clipboards back there, there's a couple coloring pages from the last couple weeks. There's the note page. Go ahead and grab those and then find your way back to your seats. Let's open up our Bibles this morning to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13. Hebrews 1, 13. We're going to be reading through chapter 2, verse 4. If you're just joining us, we've been studying through the book of Hebrews. We, we've just sort of begun that journey together. And the writer to Hebrews begins with pointing to the greatness of who Jesus is. Not what he said, not what he's done, to the greatness of who he is. And he contrasts him with all of the Old Testament uh, testimony about God. All the Old Testament uh, priests and prophets and kings that have come before. uh, Everything that has come, and he says, Jesus is greater. He contrasts him with all of the angels, all the hosts of heaven. All these powerful spirit beings, and he says, Jesus is greater. So would you stand with me as we honor the word of the Lord this morning? We're going to read from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 13, through chapter 2, verse 4. Hear now the word of the Lord. And to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who are to inherit salvation? Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. For since the message declared by angels proved to be reliable, and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? It was declared first by the Lord, and it was attested to us by those who heard, while God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles, and by the gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. God, we pray you would bless the reading of your word. We pray you would open now our hearts and minds to receive it. Let it be true spiritual food. And open our eyes that we might see Christ this morning. Our hope, our salvation. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, D.A. Carson has said this, people do not drift towards holiness. This is one of the fill in the blanks for you in your bulletin. People do not drift towards holiness apart from grace-driven effort. People do not gravitate towards godliness. Actually, I'm not sure if that's in your bulletin or not. Now that I say that, I don't, I don't remember if I put that in there. Uh, our, our natural tendency, if, if left to ourself, is not to just drift closer and closer towards intimacy with God. In fact, it's the exact opposite, and your life has testified to that. That at moments where you have not uh, been diligent and faithful in your walk with God, and that's sort of what we're going to point us to this morning, our lives tend to drift. So the writer to Hebrews warns us. He said, it's true of you. It's actually been proven uh, true in the Old Testament. We see Samson in the Old Testament takes a strict vow before God as a Nazarite. God endues him with strength. His hair had nothing to do with it. It was just a symbol of what was going on inside of his heart. And yet, as he compromises on that vow, he slowly drifts away. And Judges 16.20 says he did not know that the Lord had left him. Even King Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, it says of him four times, and we find it in 1 Kings chapter 11, his heart moved away from the Lord. Oh, Christian, if it's possible for the wisest man who ever lived, I want to suggest it might be possible for us to drift. I'm not talking about somehow uh, becoming unmoored from Christ and losing your salvation. I believe that salvation belongs to the Lord, not to us. And yet, what we find is we drift away from all that safe harbor of salvation. And our lives find themselves in desperate, desperate places. Anybody here ever heard of the Wellington River? 
Wellington River is the river that feeds into Niagara Falls. If you are ever foolish enough, and let me say, that anybody ever been to Niagara Falls? Foolish. I, I saw boats out on that river, and I said, you are stupid. Anyway, so if you're ever dumb enough to put a boat on the Wellington River, there are signs there that uh, say this, do you have an anchor? Question mark. And underneath that, do you know how to use it? Question mark. Because if you are adrift on that river and do not have something with which to anchor yourself, you are in peril. Your life is in danger. Christian, let me suggest this morning that the current of this world is strong and subtle and seductive. Oh, it appears that you're just floating along, that that nothing has moved, nothing has changed, and that you are being drawn further and further and further away from Christ and closer towards this world. Now, as Christians, you sit here this morning and go, I I, I got it, Uh, in the world but not of it. Nailed it. I I remember that from Sunday school. Uh, I'm all ready to go on that. And then we jump into the water, thinking I can be in the water but not of the water. Let me ask you a question. Anybody ever been to the ocean or even Lake Michigan and just gotten in the water, played in the waves? Anybody ever done that before? Have you had this experience? Like your family goes to the ocean and you put all of your stuff right here. And then you get in the waves that are right there and you don't move. You're not going side to side. You're not, you're not traveling great distances. In fact, you're just sort of keeping up with the current, the ebb and flow of what is coming back and forth. And then half an hour later, you look up for your stuff. Anybody had this experience? Where is it? Way down there. Now, did your stuff move or did you move? You did. Did it feel like you moved? No, in fact, it it felt like your stuff got stolen. Anybody had that? Like, oh, no, everything's gone. No, no, no. You drifted and you were not aware of it. You didn't even know it. How easily does that slip into the Christian life. Verse 1, Hebrews chapter 2 says, therefore we must, in light of the gospel, in light that Jesus is greater than the prophets, Jesus is greater than the angels, he says we must pay closer attention. This morning we're going to look at the rest of the verses, then we're going to cycle back and we're going to end with verse 1. But I think it's important for us to think about the fact that our lives, our world, are constantly bombarding us with voices, with images, with advertising, fighting for your attention. Alternative saviors, with, if I could just get this, I would be happy. If I could just obtain this, if I could just go out with her, I could be happy. Those are alternative saviors. They promise joy and salvation, yet they usually only lift us, leave us drifting and alone. That, that new car that you just thought you had to have because it would bring you joy and salvation. Uh, the next year's model come out. And have you seen what they have on that? Oh, it's ridiculous. I can't believe I'm driving this thing. Th- those new shoes that your kid just had to have. Don't make them run any faster or jump any higher. Or look any cooler, just so you know, kids. All right, good talk. So here, here's what we talked about last week. Last week, the Old Testament law, it said, was given in a message delivered by angels. Uh, Verse 14, we read it a little bit ago. And they Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? For since the message declared by angels... So the Old Testament message of the gospel that we find within the prophetic writings, within the teachings, it says delivered by angels, declared by angels. If that proved reliable and every transgression or disobedience received a just retribution, how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Just a couple things. We're not going to go back, go back and look at what we did last week. Uh, but just to mention, angels serve for our sake. It's not for their own praise. In fact, every time someone tries to praise or worship them in the Bible, they immediately stop them. They, they are serving for the sake of the elect and the glory of God. But secondly, in here, we see that their message proved reliable. What they said, what they promised, what, how they said things worked proved reliable. So message delivered by angels. By the way, did, did it sound strange that we get God's word in the Old Testament through angels? I thought it came through Moses. I, I thought it came uh, through uh, the prophets who spoke. Well, Acts chapter 7, verse 53 As Stephen is about to be stoned, he's making his indictment of the Jewish people. He says this, 
you who received the law that was given through angels but have not obeyed it. Yes, Moses is the one who wrote the law, but Stephen says this was delivered by angels. We also find that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 19, the law was given through angels. Eric McPherson, who's a pastor, says this, If we are to take the message seriously, their message seriously, how much more should we take the good news that has come directly from the Son of God? It's one thing to send a messenger, and it's another thing to come yourself to deliver the message. Jesus is better than the prophets in the Old Testament, even the angels who brought God's message. And here's one of the fill in the blanks for you. Angels delivered messages from God. Jesus spoke messages as God. Let me say that again. Angels delivered messages from God. Jesus spoke messages as God. So verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation? Now, we're not going to go into all of the uh, words behind this, but uh, throughout this passage, especially verses 1 through 4, there are just a bunch of nautical terms, boat terms that are in here. And one of the connotations with this word neglect is to not have an anchor. How shall we escape if our lives are not anchored to the gospel of Jesus Christ? His word Without the gospel, we will drift away from the harbor of Christ into the current of this world. And here's the problem with drifting. It's so gradual that you barely even notice anything has changed. And yet, here's what it says. If it was true of the angels, and here's how he says it's true. Every instance of ignoring the law or breaking the law was rightly punished. If you failed to live up to God's perfect law, he says it was rightly punished punished just retribution which is not a popular message today in fact there's probably some of you sitting here who go i don't really believe that god would send anyone to hell if you think that we're super glad you're here but i'm going to guess it it's going to be hard to stay here very long because as we talk about the truth of god (coughs) the gospel actually begins with the fact that God has saved sinners unable to save themselves, whose only just reward from God is eternal punishment. Although we have sinned and violated his law. And yet, people today, we sort of scratch our head at that and go, well, I don't, I don't believe in that. In fact, just retribution sounds mean. Anybody, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you, you hear, they received just retribution. Like, it just kind of sounds mean. A little overbearing. Let me give you an example. All right, kids who are going to school, kids who are studying, kids who are taking tests, I want you to imagine that you stay up all night studying for a test. In fact, it's not just that night. You've been studying for weeks, but now you are spent, you're pulling an all-nighter. Hours and hours and hours studying, pouring into it, and you show up and your hard work pays off. Here's the bad news. There's this guy who's also along with you. If we go to the next one there. Uh, Mr. Too Cool for School, who doesn't study. In fact, his main hobby in school is shoving other kids into a locker. And he's sitting next to you where you're taking the test. And you, your eyes are bloodshot because you were up all night. And you're like, have you studied? He's like, nope, didn't even crack a book, man. Too cool for that. And then comes the actual test. And you, who studied all night, don't miss a single question. A minus zero. Remember those beautiful red Numbers that you used to, minus zero. I saw that so infrequently. Anyway, so, (laughs) and his just says F, like a giant red F. Oh, you're the best. Scratched on the top of his paper. And what you say is, you got what you deserved, and he got what he deserved. He did not study, and therefore, he did not deserve your A. Does that make sense? And then the teacher comes along and says, listen. I've decided that no matter what, everybody gets an A today. Now, one of you is rejoicing, and one of you is saying that's not fair. Sometimes we miscategorize the gospel as no matter what, God's just going to go, everybody gets an A. God loves everybody unconditionally. That is just not true. Just let that settle for just a second. 
The only way that God can love a sinner who deserves punishment is if he fully punishes that sinner in Christ. Oh, that debt has been paid in full. That's actually what Jesus says upon the cross. That that Greek word, tetelestai, paid in full. It's an accounting term that meant this is fully paid. And yet, it would be unjust if God just was handing out spiritual A's in all of our life. That's not how it worked. In fact, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 from the New Living Translation says this, Don't be misled. You cannot mock the justice of God. You will always harvest what you plant. What you have sown, you will always harvest. Now, one of the joys of salvation is we rejoice that we will harvest what Christ has planted. But in this life, if you unhook your anchor from the anchor of Christ and his word, you will harvest unrighteousness. All the pain that comes with that. And parents, let me give you a little bit of a warning. Stop robbing your children of pain. Stop reaping their harvest of pain for them. When they make mistakes and you step in and alleviate it because, well, I don't want my kids to go through that, they don't learn those lessons. This is how God said it was to work in this world, that when a child makes a mistake, when it is accidental or willful, especially willful, they will learn very quickly, this is a bad idea. I am reaping what I sowed. But if you reap the pain that they sowed, they will never learn. And by the time they are grown, you'll say, I don't know what's wrong with that child. Here's the answer. You. Don't run out the back. It'll get better, right? This, I promise it'll get encouraging. Stop messing it up for our children. If it's that serious with what Angel said, how much worse for those who neglect, who ignore, who disregard Jesus, our great salvation. Oh, consider this with me. He says, how will we escape? That means that there is no escape. There's no excuses. It will be severe and perfect justice. Again, not a popular thought for today. Let's just pause for just a second and remind ourselves that what's being shared here is good news. Now, it's good news that's attached to a warning, but God does not have to save us. God does not have to bless us. He doesn't have to speak and reveal that if we just turn from our sin and trust in him, this life will go better. And yet he does. This is not like a sermon uh, on taxes where, oops, you forgot to pay your taxes. Oops, you didn't even know that this tax existed. Well, here you go. There's going to be late payments and fines and penalties. It's not like, kids, when you forget to turn your homework in, anybody else besides me ever done that? And then it just sort of stacks up on you, and I have late assignment after late assignment, and you work and work and work, and you turn it in, and all you get is points off. We frequently told our kids, like, turn it in, like 50% is better than 0%, right? An F is better than nothing, but that's not what this is. This is a great salvation being offered to us. And we see this beginning of reflection of that in Psalm 19, verse 7. It says, The law, the instructions of the Lord, are perfect. They revive the soul. The decrees of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. Psalm 32, verse 8, The Lord says, I will make you wise and I will show you where to go. I will guide you and watch over you. One translation says, With my eye upon you. Look at Hebrews 2, verse 3 again. It says, it was declared first by the Lord. This good news, this offer, this hope, even though it's mixed with a warning, this hope of salvation was first declared by the Lord, by Jesus, and then was attested to, to us by those who have heard directly from him. And thirdly, God also bore witness with signs and wonders and various miracles and with gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to to his will. This message of the gospel first comes from Jesus, that Christ himself comes as God to deliver the message. And then other messengers, not just angels, now apostles, those who walked with Jesus, those who heard the very words of Jesus come and testify, this is true. They testify it with their words and they testify it with their lives. 
Every one of the original 12 disciples will die for his faith, with the exception of John. Judas dies at his own hand because condemnation so overwhelms him. The rest of them die at someone else's hand because they refused to take back what they had said about Jesus being God. John is the only one who survives. Oh, isn't it lucky to be John? No, he was boiled alive in oil and lived. If you think he's the lucky one, go home and fire up your deep fryer that you're going to make lunch with and then just plunge your hand into it and see if you don't hope for death. Permanently changed and disfigured by it. And he's the lucky one. And yet all of them testified to the truth of Jesus Christ because they never recanted. They never turned back from it. This is true even if it costs me my life. It's the same message they heard from Jesus. And then thirdly, I love this. It's as if, I don't know if you've been in here. uh, Stick around when the service is over. Uh, There's usually music playing at the end, and it it plays out of these speakers that gloriously just float from the ceiling. And then as we turn things off, one of the things that frequently happens is we'll flip a little power switch back here because back under there, uh, there's uh, amplifiers that power a subwoofer. You don't even know it's there until you turn it off, and it's like all the bottom just drops out. Like, oh, this is actually a really thin sound that's coming out because there was something underneath. The thin sound coming out of the apostles, the thin sound coming out of the church today is reinforced underneath by the God who speaks. And God attests to his word. And God says it is true, confirming it with signs and wonders confirming it with gifts of the Holy Spirit. Why has God given gifts to the church today? Why do we believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is at work today? Spoiler alert, it's not so that you can have your best life now. In fact, that's idolatry with you as the idol. No. It is so that once again, God might testify, my word is true, my gospel is trustworthy. He gives gifts to build up the church. He gives gifts that the church might testify to the truth and the greatness of the gospel. And therefore, he says, pay much closer attention to what you have heard. The law of God says that God is holy and the only way for you or I to come before him is to be ourselves perfectly holy. Only today we would respond, well, nobody's perfect. I mean, come on. We know that, you know. We're human. Don't we use that all the time as an excuse for when we fall short? Well, I'm just human. Well, that's exactly what the law requires if we are to come before God. By the way, this is why it is absolute foolishness when sinners who are saved by grace look down our noses at somebody else who isn't quite as far along as we are, and we go, what's wrong with you? Why can't you just get your act together? Why can't you just try harder and do better? Why? Because the law demands absolute perfection out of you and me as well. And we can't do that. James chapter 2, verse 10 says, Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Now, if that verse doesn't offend you, let me read it one more time. Anybody ever tried hard to be a good person? Show of hands. Go ahead and put them up. Let me know you're still awake. Anybody ever tried hard to be a good Christian? Oh, this is awesome. I'm talking to the right people. Here's God's good news for you. Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. Well, that's a bummer. Wait, wait, I've tried really hard my whole life and you're saying it's all for nothing? There's no way. That's not fair. I've worked so hard. I've done so many things. I'm a good person. In fact, I'm almost there. It's like we're climbing a ladder, and I'm almost there. How can you say all of that, all of that good stuff that I've done before falls short of the glory of God? Let me give you a great example of this. If you go to that, that slide, Psalm 24 asks the question, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in the presence of God? By the way, doesn't this look like a Christian screen, screensaver? Oh, it's just It's motivational. Like, they're, they're climbing up the hill. Just hey, By the way, I actually went in and photoshopped all of the safety ropes off of them. Like, no safety rope. They're just climbing. Just boldly taking faith in their bare hands, reaching out for heaven. Now, imagine our, our walk to God is us climbing, free climb, 1,000-foot cliff. 
All right? That's the idea. 1,000 foot cliff. And you have studied. You've put on all of the hard work, all the preparation, and then you begin the climb. Now, this, this looks like a good Christian screensaver. It's motivational, but I think this one would be more accurate. Let's go to the next one. There we go. That, that's me falling, by the way. So you as the church, you look at me. You see that I've climbed 25 feet. By the way, I would be dizzy at 25 feet hanging off the side of a cliff. I don't care about no 1,000 foot, right? 25, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's terrible. And I slip and fall at 25 feet, and you shake your head at me, and you go, I thought you were a pastor. You, you really let us down. Because you go on to climb 30 feet, or 40, or maybe even 50 feet. That's five stories up, by the way, before you fall which looks like this. (laughs) Let me ask you a question. Does it matter? Does it matter how high you are able to climb? How about if you didn't climb 50 feet, you climbed 500 feet before you fell? How about you didn't do that? You climbed 990 feet before you fell. What's the end result? It's the same every time. Come on, church, what is it? Death. Death. If this slide came with sound effects, it would sound like this. Listen, there are no second-place trophies or participation ribbons for the Christian life. You don't line up coffins and go, well, this one came in a close second. Did super good, super good. Your family should be proud. That would be ridiculous. Here is the truth. No one ever reaches the top without Jesus. Oh, do we climb? Yes, in fact, we do with the strength that God provides. Do we fall down and get back up? Yes, we do, with the strength that God provides. Do we have the power to have perfect holiness and righteousness in ourselves? Not even close. You know what's missing from this picture is the hand of God that grabs us and holds us and keeps us. That's what Peter says. His divine power and righteousness are guarding for us a salvation to be revealed. This would make a better screensaver. That is the only way that you make it up this mountain into the presence of God as if he carries you. He does all the work, and then here's a fill in the blank. We work because he is working. That's John Piper said that. Because he is at work, because he has held us, because he has strengthened us, because he grabbed us when we fell and put us back up, because he is the one pushing and sustaining us, we work. You have done none of the work to earn your own salvation. It was all God, and yet he goes, you have to work really hard. It earns nothing. It is all God's work. Philippians chapter 2 verse 13 says, it is God who works in you both to will, to want to, and to work for his good pleasure. Your desire to follow God comes from God. It's just a beautiful picture. This is true because Romans 3 23 says, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Every single one of us do not deserve to be climbing on that mountain. We have fallen short of the glory of God, and yet it is God who rescues. This passage in Hebrews 2 says, Every transgression, the the, the word for transgression means going around God's law. Every time we go around the law of God, or every disobedience, the word disobedience actually isn't disobedient here, it means to mishear. And, And the idea is to intentionally not listen. Parents, you ever felt like this happens in your household? (laughs) Wives, you ever felt like this happens in your household? Are you intentionally not listening to me? That's the idea here. Like, I'm choosing to block you out so that I can do whatever I want to. Every time we go around God's law or every time we say, God, I will do it my way and not yours, it receives a just retribution. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, The free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Christian, keep in mind, this is not a message of condemnation, but of hope. This is not someone standing here saying, see, I told you you weren't good enough. No, this is a warning of hope. Do not miss this great salvation. Do not miss or neglect that which is being offered to you. Oh, how will we escape if our lives and our hope and our family are not anchored to that great salvation? There's a chance that you are here today 
and you actually, in thinking about this, think you're fine because of some past experience that you had. I just this last week uh, came across a, a little Bible that I had when I was just a tiny little kid, and it has the date in there that I was saved, the, the date that I was filled with the Holy Spirit. And I could look back on that and say, that finished the work. It's all done. I don't have to do anything else. I would say if that's you, there's a chance that your life is drifting. I'm not saying we don't uh, put hope and confidence in, number one, God's ability to save and our commitment to follow him. And yet sometimes that line just gets pulled up, pulled up by the things of this world. And we start to drift. We start being carried along by the current of the world, by your life, by relationships, by thoughts and emotions that reflect the fact that we are adrift. We talked about last week taking stock of our emotional state that we are in. I I just want to call our attention to that again. How have you you been feeling? What, what What does your thought life look like recently? Do you spend most of your time frustrated? If I asked your family, would they say most of the time you are irritable and grumpy? Are you antagonistic? Like your heart has grown so hard that you are antagonistic towards other Christians and even the church. Or even worse, have you grown apathetic? I feel nothing. Here's one of the the fill-in-the-blanks for you. This is important. We don't measure our salvation by our emotions. We don't measure our salvation by our emotions. Why is that true? Because salvation belongs to the Lord. Salvation is not about your emotional willpower to climb that cliff. No, salvation belongs to God, but our emotions are a measure of how we are walking out that great salvation. Are there things in our hearts that we have just turned off? Are are there things in our hearts that we have just given ourselves over to and what it leads to is anger and frustration that usually gets taken out on our families? You want a a bit of a a shocker reveal, go home today and say, what's the dominant uh, emotion that you see in my life, honey? And then put your seatbelt on because she might just tell you. We have to actually work hard to recognize when our lives begin to drift. And maybe you're here today, and you're a Christian who says, I think that's me. Yes, God saved me. Yes, I believe unshakably that there is a God who rules sovereignly from the throne in heaven. Yes, I believe unshakably that Christ died as a substitute for my sins, and yet my eyes have not been fixed on Jesus. I've looked at everything else, and it has undone me. I feel like that person who is adrift. And maybe you're here this morning, and you're not a Christian. In fact, you've never trusted in Christ. And I would say, oh, take heart. There is a God who knows you and loves you, who's been working all things together that you might know him. So look back at verse 1 with me. Therefore, we must pay much closer attention to what we've heard, lest we drift away. Those words, the Greek words for pay closer attention, actually mean to give full attention, to set your course and keep it. That we make a decision of our own heart, because of the grace given us in Christ, that we say, this is the course I will take and I will stay to it. Then when it says much closer, it's actually extraordinary exceedingly, to go beyond expectations, further than the utter limits, going beyond what was anticipated. I'm going to set my course, my eyes on Jesus, and then I'm going to be ridiculous about it, would be another way to say this. Looking to Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus, setting your course and attention on Jesus. And yet, so often as believers, we go, well, I tried that, And look where I ended up. It just didn't work. Anybody ever thought that before? What happened? Here it is. He he says, fix your eyes on this. Pay closer attention or you'll drift. Man, I I don't know your story. I don't know what was going on in your heart or your mind. I guarantee this. If you have found yourself there, it is not God's fault. You drifted. 
You put your eyes and your attention on something else. That, that word to drift it is actually another nautical term. It means to float alongside. And the idea in the ancient world, they didn't have motors on their boats. So if the, if the ship is coming into the harbor, if you don't take your sails down in time, your ship will just pound into the harbor. Too fast, can't stop, slams into the harbor. And so what you got to do, you got to take the sails down early. Remove the wind that is pushing you. But if you do it too early, oh, it looks like you're there. You're just so close that it feels like I'm at the harbor. And I think so many Christians do this. Only what you did was you came close, but I'm still in the current. And then you drift. Man, I, I had times where God really moved me in the church. And I remember I, I was convicted and I prayed and I cried and somebody prayed with me. I don't know why that didn't fix it. It's because you came to the harbor, but you didn't anchor in the harbor, and you drifted. And you let drift continue. And I would challenge you, what is it that you are drifting towards? What is it that has pulled your anchor loose from Christ? This word drifting actually only occurs here in all the New Testament. It's the only time it shows up. It's this idea of sinning by slipping away. Not by active sin. So we think about some of the big ones today of uh, not committing adultery, internet pornography, not stealing. I think we can all agree murder is a bad idea, right? And yet this isn't that. This is the sinning by not doing anything. I, I'm good. I'm close. I, I, I'm as near as I need to be. And then I just let it go, and I begin to drift. Sinning by slipping away from God's anchor. Gradually drifting away into spiritual defeat. Oh, and it happens so slow. It's so subtle. We don't see it coming until we find ourselves lost at sea. My question for you is this as we wrap it up. Have you drifted? Have you neglected this great salvation? If so, Ravi Zacharias, great apologist who just passed away this past year, said this, sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay. And it will cost you more than you want to pay. I actually put that in your bulletin for you because I want you to see those words. I want you to hear that warning. It is not a warning of condemnation. It is a warning of hope. There is a safe harbor in Christ. There's a place where God holds you securely in the palm of his hand. By the way, when you're adrift at sea as a Christian, God still holds you securely in the palm of his hand, but he will let you reap what you sow until you say, I must return to that harbor. And so the call today is turn from sin and fix your eyes on Jesus. Worship team, if you guys would come on up. Thank you for your patience this morning. I know we've had a lot of stuff with baby dedications and uh, other things as part of the service. And yet I don't want to skimp on this. I, I don't want to pass over this. It would, it would be incredibly unfaithful if we talked to you as individuals about making sure you're not drifting in your walk with God and then didn't challenge you as families. Go home and sink the anchor of your family into Christ. Talk about where there is drift. So here's some of the family discussion to have later on today. How have we, you, oh man, parents, put your seatbelt on if you're going to ask this question to your kids. How have we drifted as a family and then as individuals? How have you drifted? Where have you seen drift in your life? And where have we done it as a family? What are the things that are fighting for our attention? What can we do to turn back and fix our eyes on Jesus? Man, I, I think it's so important. One of the things Christian parents try and do all the time is look perfect in front of their kids. That is the opposite thing your kids need. They need to see you living with the fruit of the Spirit under control. And yet when we fall short of the glory of God, you know what they need to see? Repentance. You're modeling for them what it looks like to actually being a living Christian, not a saint of old who no longer sins, a living Christian who daily needs repentance. Martin Luther said, all of the Christian life is one of repentance. Pray together, repent, 
of areas in your life where you have allowed. Start with you. Don't start with a generic family. Start with you. God, I have allowed this to cause me to drift in my relationship with you. And then pray together as a family and ask that God would help you fully trust him. The answer to this is not do better. Try harder. Come to church more. Do more right things than you do wrong things. No, the prayer is help me fix again my eyes on Jesus to trust him more. God, make me more faithful. And then one more aspect, and that's planning. What's one thing that you can start doing this week to get back on course? What's a course correction that you can make if it says that we are to set our course in fixing our eyes towards Jesus? By the way, part of this plan should be we don't walk this out alone. Don't have a little family meeting and then uh, stamp it top secret. No one gets to see this. Giant mistake. Pull other brothers and sisters into this. Man, brother, we, we talked with our family last night. I was so convicted. Here's what's going on in my, my life. Uh, ladies, talk to another lady. Man, here's what we talked about. Here's where we've been struggling. Would you just pray for me? Would you help keep me accountable in this area? Part of Christ's work in your life is joining you with other believers, which is why being here is important. Man, I'm so grateful that we have live stream, although I would also be so grateful if our internet actually worked. Uh, And yet if you're just watching on live stream, you're missing out on a huge component of being part of the body of Christ. We need each other in our lives. So here's the challenge. Find somebody this week and call them and say, hey, here's what I've been struggling with. In fact, uh, why don't we stand together? We're just going to close in worship by reminding ourselves of the gospel. Casting our minds back at what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. But before we sing, I want you to call to mind, have I drifted? Am I one of those people who's allowed drift to come and separate me in my walk with God? By the way, you don't see it first in your walk with God. You see it first in your walk with other people. That irritation towards your husband or your wife, that that nagging thing you have towards your kids all the time. Oh, that constant grumbling at work, it means something has gone sideways in your heart. If that is you, I want you to do two things. I want you to, number one, acknowledge it before the Lord. I'm going to give you a a chance to just stand here for a second and say, God, that's me. Here's the area I have allowed uh, sin and the love of this world to cause my heart to drift, and I repent. It's sin. We don't say I'm sorry. We don't decide to do better. We repent of it, and we ask God's forgiveness and his grace to go forward. Here's the second thing. I want you to find somebody. You don't have to have the conversation in this room but somebody today and go, hey, I'm going to call you later this week. And what, what you're saying is, hey, I have one of these areas, and we're not going to have a big line of people praying for each other here. I actually think it's better if it happens as a family, that the family reaches out to one another. The family says, here's where I'm struggling, and the family comes in and says, brother, let me pray for you. Sister, let me encourage you. So let's just stand first before the Lord and say, God, search my heart. Where have I drifted? I'm guessing if you have the evidence, it's all over in your life. God, show me where I've drifted. Then repent of it right now. We're going to sing together in just a second. Lord, we're just reminded with the psalm writer prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. I thank you, God, that even when we have drifted, that you hear our cries. You don't reject us and turn us away. In fact, you do the opposite. You draw us in closer to your presence. And I pray for my brothers and sisters right now do just that. Let's just sing this together. Lift your eyes to Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus. I cast my mind to
As we sing, just encourage you to continue to cry out to God. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never actually surrendered your life to him. Man, this is the moment to just say, Jesus, save me. If you're here this morning, you want to bring your tithes and offerings. The boxes are up here at the front. You can do that while we sing. Let's just remind ourselves, point ourselves to our great need for him, the God who has provided all things for us. So as we continue to sing, just come bring your tithes and offerings to the Lord.
amen, God, there will be a day. Oh, what good news for rebel hearts like ours. There will be a day that you will so reveal yourself that we will never again look away. We will never again not have our eyes fixed on Jesus. And yet those of us here this morning who say, God, I wish that was true today, we know that we will leave this place and our eyes and our hearts will be drawn towards other things. So we say, today, fix my eyes. Today, fix my heart on him. Oh God, that we might worship you in spirit and in truth, that we might be more faithful that you might be glorified in our lives and our families and our church and this planet. That's the heart of your church. That's our prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. And all the church said, amen. Amen. God, may it be true. Even so, come quickly, Lord. God bless you. You are dismissed. Just invite you, if you haven't done it yet, uh, the tithe and offering boxes are up front, but especially uh, the box for Dave and Wilma and the box to give towards the log splitter that's up there. Come and be a...